Hi, this is Catherine. This is Taking Tea with Catherine. This is China Rose Black Tea, a favorite of mine. And also I thought it would be appropriate today because, I mean, if you can get through reading volumes of poetry without the mention of roses, well, I don't know what kind of poetry you're reading. But, uh, so I thought that was rather apt. And so for today, um, I thought it's the last Thursday of July and therefore Jane Austen July. So I'm going to read another poem that was written around her lifetime. Um, and that had to do with something that was happening in her lifetime that was an interesting event and that she was slightly connected to, not exactly, but in just her own, in her own way. Um, so I'll make that connection, I hope, later. And so I'm reading John Keats, which he is definitely one of my favorite poets of this time and of any time, so but that was good. And the, uh, the poem's name is Written on the Day That Mr. Lee Hunt Left Prison. So it says, or it reads, What though, for showing truth to flattered state, kind Hunt was shut in prison, yet has he, in his immortal spirit, been as free as the sky-searching lark, and as elate? <clears throat> Minion of grandeur, think you he did wait? Think you he did not, but prison walls did see, till so unwilling thou unturnst the key? Ah, no, far happier, nobler was his fate. In Spencer's halls he strayed, and bowers fair, culling enchanted flowers, and he flew with daring Milton through the fields of air, to regions of his own, his genius true, took happy flights. Who shall his name impair when thou art dead, and all thy wretched crew? So, it's a bit of a romantic, aptly romantic, uh, telling of Lee Hunt's experience in prison. Uh, I think... Keats was saying, well, you know, yeah, you think you can shut him up, but he's always, as long as he can read and he's got his mind with him, he's always going to be, you know, at least mentally in another place. Which is true. It does help to have that as an escape, no matter what kind of confines one finds themselves in. Sometimes you find yourself just like a lot of us have, having to be home more than we had expected over the past year and uh, not being able to travel the way we wanted to. And being able to read definitely is an escape. It's definitely a way of traveling when you can't travel but I don't think that Lee Hunt was exactly enjoying his time in prison either so I say this because I'm going to read to you from um, an excerpt it's not poetry this is um, from Morrison what is his first name sorry about that Robert Morrison's uh, The Regency Years which I've been reading in I haven't finished yet but I thought this was an interesting uh, account of Lee Hunt's experience here <clears throat> so it says Lee Hunt, editor of the radical Sunday newspaper, The Examiner, is the most famous prisoner of the Regency. From the founding of the paper in 1808, <coughs> excuse me, he and his brother John, its publisher, lashed the government and the monarchy in its pages and evaded the various prosecutions mounted against them. But when in March 1812, as the regent approached his 50th birthday, the Tory Morning Post hailed him as the glory of the people and an Adonis in loveliness. It was another stomach-turning piece of government tosh that the Hunts sh simply could not let pass. Yeah, I kind of understand that if you've seen pictures of... Anyway, in reply, they reached an apex of scorn that was clearly defamatory. The regent was a violator of his word, a libertine over head and ears in debt and disgrace, a despiser of domestic ties, the companion of gamblers and demireps, whatever... A man who has just closed half a century without one single claim on the gratitude of his country or the respect of posterity. Sir William Garrow acted for the government. Henry Brougham, Brougham, I don't know how to pronounce his name, the future Whig Lord Chancellor, defended the hunts. It took the jury all of ten minutes to convict them of libeling the regent. The brothers were sentenced to two years in prison, Lee in Horsemonger Lane and John at Colbath Fields. Lee entered his cell for the first time on February 3rd, 1813, and when, within days his health began to give way. I don't blame him. Ruffian laughter and the constant clanking of chains badly unnerved him, as did the locking of all the doors and gates between him and the outside world. I do not exaggerate when I say there were ten or eleven, he declared, and every fresh turning of the key seemed a malignant insult to my love of liberty. His own arguments regarding his status as a political prisoner, coupled with the voices of influential, influential Whig supporters, soon won him concessions, and within six weeks he had been moved from his initial cell into far more salubrious accommodations on the south side of the prison inf infirmary. Here his family joined him, I think that used to happen, and a carpenter and painter transformed the rooms into a bower for a poet. 
the walls papered with a trellis of roses, the ceiling colored with clouds and sky, and the barred windows screened with Venetian blinds. It's better than some people's living, right? Nowadays, Hunt added bookcases, fresh flowers, busts, pictures, and a pianoforte. I mean, come on. Further, outside there was a small prison yard that he converted into a garden with green palings, a trellis, a narrow lawn, more flowers, and an apple tree from which we managed to get a pudding the second year. It was one of the most extraordinary establishments in the whole of the Regency. Hunt's cell became a fashionable rallying point for liberal and radical thinkers, and many came to call, including the editor John Scott, the essayist William Hazlitt, the novelist, novelist Mariah Edgeworth, the philosopher James Mill, the painter David Wilkie, and the newspaper man Thomas Barnes. The essayist Charles Lamb and his sister, the children's writer Mar Mary Lamb, which I have to talk about her one day, I really do. That is a subject. Oh my goodness. Any of you who know about Mary Lamb, oh my goodness, came in all weathers. When Jeremy Be Bentham visited, he and Hunt played Battledore, a precursor of badminton. That actually sounds like fun. Byron called on more than one occasion and dubbed Hunt the wit in the dungeon. The painter Benjamin Robert, Robert Hayden arrived one morning before Hunt was out of bed, calling for his breakfast and sending those laughs of his about the place that sound like the trumpets of Jericho. The government had no doubt hoped that imprisoning Hunt would lead to the collapse of the examiner, but the paper reached new heights of popularity during the brothers' trial, and it continued to appear throughout their time in prison as a result of the efforts of loyal friends like Lamb, Barnes, and Hazlitt, who wrote articles for it, and the tireless commitment of the brothers themselves, who sent copy across town to each other and to the examiner office. What is more, Hunt kept hope alive in the examiner by champion Catholic emancipation, the freedom of the press, the abolition of slavery, and the reform of parliament. He wrote in his small garden while the noises of distress, fear, and anger were all around him. Yet he completed a drama, aptly entitled The Descent of Liberty, 1815, as well as parts of his finest poem, The Story of Rimini, I Rimini, 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 I should know this, 1816, which he dedicated to Byron, who supplied him with books, well, yeah, and which reflected his growing weariness. Sad is the strain in, with which I cheer my long and caged hours. When Hunt was finally released on February 3rd, 1815, Keats wrote a so sonnet praising his immortal spirit, as we saw before, as we heard before, you yeah, know, I saw it. But it was soon evident that the last two years had taken a terrible toll and that the pictures and visitors and flowers had ultimately been no match for the miseries of life in a Regency prison. Tired and ill, Hunt later recollected that his time in Horsemonger Lane had given him a shock from which he never fully recovered. Although he probably did better than a lot of the people of his time. Um, so that I thought was kind of interesting. I mean... I suppose in that time period and in many time periods, if I had to be in prison, that's not the worst experience. Having people come over, having family move in with you, being able to have a garden. And there are some prisons even now that are practically just health clubs. You know what I mean? You hear about these things, but, but he was not really at liberty and obviously just hearing all the sounds around him which makes him very relatable to me. Anyone who is, who is very much affected by sounds in their vicinity, I find, you know, relatable. <laughs> so I think Keats was very kind in writing about him and his experiences. I think the point Keats was trying to make was, you know, you can't keep him down. No matter how much you try to keep this, this guy quiet and imprison him, he still got all these resources to him and he's better than you and in the long run, he'll win and all that stuff, whatever. But it wasn't exactly something that Lee Hunt... I wonder if, after those two years, if if he were able to repeat, you know, to do, do over, you know, time travel, would he have written what he wrote in The Examiner? Good question, I think, because we always wonder, would we do the same in certain situations? So let me know in the comments below what you think, if you would have, if you would have done what he did, knowing what prison was like in those days and all that. Any, any comment, really, on this poem and, and this situation I'd find interesting. And how do we connect this to Jane Austen? Well, obviously, she didn't really know most of these people. I'm not sure. Every once in a while, you know, in her life, she did come across certain people. There's somebody, a couple of people that, in biographies, she's run across that, um, and I'm not sure. I don't think it was Lee Hunt, though. But somebody else there was. She had she had, had connections to uh, Lord Byron. I could, you know... I. There were a couple of like uh, degrees of separation that she had um, 
although I don't know if she ever met him. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> but she definitely spoke of him. Uh, I don't think she ever wrote of Keats. I don't think. But anyway, um, but, but the connection I'm thinking of is when um, she was going to uh, publish Emma, which is one of her most popular books. Uh, well, who was it? Someone got in touch with uh, someone who represented the king, the prince regent um, at the time. He wasn't king yet. Um, now I'm forgetting because it's been a while since I, since I read it. But um, anyway, she was able to tour. Yeah, rather, I don't remember if she actually was able to tour his one of his libraries or something, but I think she was in, invited to. can't remember offhand if she actually did. But... For the Book of Emma, she was she was encouraged to write a dedication to the Prince Regent, and you know, in, in the book, de the book to be dedicated to him, and she did, but she didn't like to. I don't think she uh, was happy to do it. She just did, you know. I think what you, one feels obligated to do in those situations. So I've seen quotes that she's. Um, written about the Prince Regent and, you know, in letters and things, and she had very um, small opinion of him. So, yeah, so I'm, I'm pretty sure that she and Lee Hunt could have had a bit to talk about in that situation, but I think she kind of was a little more circumspe circumspect in her feelings. So that was uh, Poetry Thursday for this time, and that was... Uh, the last one for Jane Austen July. I don't know what I'm going to do next week. We shall see. Um, but for now, this is Catherine taking tea with Catherine. Have a lovely tea and poetry-filled day.